Welcome back to Questing Beast. I'm Ben. Today we'll be taking a look at this review copy I was sent of Gunderholfen, which is a mega dungeon and mini campaign setting compatible with Osric and other OSR fantasy role playing games. Before we get started, though, of course, a huge shout out to everyone on Patreon. As you may or may not know, YouTube pays virtually nothing, even if you have a relatively good sized channel like Questing Beast, which we're coming up on 30,000 subscribers now. And YouTube pays maybe a dollar for every thousand views or so. So even on a channel of my size, the YouTube revenue is basically a pittance. Um, Patreon and the people on Patreon have been my salvation. These people are amazing. They're going out of their way to show their support. They're pledging, they're incredibly generous, and it's making this whole channel worthwhile to take the time and the effort to make all of these things. Thank you so much to everyone on Patreon for all of your support over the years. Let's look into what we have here on Gunderholfen. Here is our back cover. This entire book was created by one guy, including all of the illustrations. That's an enormous feat, given the gigantic size of this thing. It has uh, 10 levels, I believe, um, going all the way down, 10 main dungeon levels and 22 sub-levels. It has 930 keyed locations. It has 40 maps. This thing is huge. I can't even imagine how long it took um, them to make it. Looking inside what we get. So this is a print on demand book and it does show, but that's you know, what you get with print on demand. So for example, the uh, front cover here, you can see that there's like, it's coming off of the spine a little bit there. That's just because of the glue quality that you get with print on demand. It doesn't necessarily handle really big books all that well. The book, however, is large and heavy enough that it does lie relatively flat, which makes it quite easy to read and reference in play. This is designed for older editions of D&D. It has that aesthetic going for it. It's using a you know Futura font, which makes it look like a lot of the old manuals. And a lot of effort has been taken here to make this uh, quite usable compared to some of the adventures that I've seen before. Uh, mostly you'll see things like the room descriptions are quite short, which makes them very easy to read. Um, I would like to see some more bolding or bullet points and things like that to help me pull out information even quicker. But for the most part, it's not really a big deal because the rooms are quite terse to begin with. We also see things like hit point trackers. So if there's five kobolds in this kitchen, then you will have five numbers for the number of hit points that each of them has. And you can use a pencil and write on the paper to actually track uh, their hit points as they decrease. So this is intended to be written on, uh, which makes up for the fact a little bit that it is print on demand. Uh, the paper quality is fairly low. You can see through it, but you can think of it more as like an expendable book or a consumable book that you might get for like uh, college and you're writing in it. You know, it's like a, a workbook. I like that idea. Um, as I said, all the descriptions are very uh, straightforward, um, easy to run. There is not a huge amount of variety, especially in the first couple levels. Um, let's look at the maps so I can tell you, uh, show you what I mean here. Um, one unfortunate thing is that the maps are all at the back, which is a little strange. When I started reading this, I got right into the room descriptions and I was wondering, where is the map? And I had to look through the whole book to find it. It would make sense more, I think, if it was at the front of the book. And especially if we had little mini maps uh, inserted into uh, the different pages on the book, that would be hugely helpful. That way you would never have to flip back and forth. You could just read the room description and immediately see how it uh, related to all of the nearby rooms. So going back to our maps. So we have the general area that this map is found in. There's some similarities to things like um, Barrow Maze. Uh, in the sense that you, you do actually have a big hex that you're exploring or that you can explore and a connected city. But of course, the main feature is the dungeon. The city is more just like a resting stop. So here you have the side view of the dungeon with your levels going down. You'll notice that there is an entrance on level one, but there's also an entrance on level five and level eight. So as your characters level up, you can sort of take shortcuts to start out deeper in the dungeon. And here we have level one. Um, it's split into a couple little maps here. Level one is mostly demi-humans. You have kobolds and goblins and things like that. And it's very dense and very combat-centric, which really isn't my preference. 
I tend to prefer my dungeons with a high degree of tricks, traps, weird stuff, just like people to talk to, uh, puzzles to solve, um, and like mapping that you have to do where you have to figure out how everything fits together. There's not a whole lot of that here. A lot of it is simply going from room to room and you know, there's a goblin in that room or there's another kobold in that room or there's five kobolds in that room um, or that maybe there's like a trap in the floor that you have to step over. So it's very vanilla in that sense. And some people like that. Some people want a very straightforward adventure that doesn't have a lot of um, hipster weirdness going on in it. And this would fulfill that need. It feels very old school in that sense. Less OSR and more just straight up old school. When we look at the actual layout of the dungeon, we see that it is fairly linear. It doesn't look like it at first, but if we actually trace the way that you travel through this dungeon, um, it has a lot of branching paths, but it has very few uh, loops of any kind. So really to explore the whole dungeon, whenever you come to any sort of intersection, you just pick one direction and you explore it to its end. And then you just backtrack again to come to that intersection. And then you try the other intersection. And then just by repeating this pattern, you'll get through the whole dungeon. You don't have a lot of layouts where um, there's a lot of interconnectivity and a lot of loops and loops within loops. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, that becomes a little bit more prevalent as we go on and as we get deeper into these dungeons. Um, but it is fairly just branching structured. There is some variety in the types of levels that we come to. For example, we have collapsed cities here. We have, I think this is a mushroom forest, if I remember correctly. We have some giant pits here. We have these large open spaces. And we even have some really fun, weird stuff that we start running into eventually, where we have a floating level. So there's a whole parallel dimension that you can access inside this dungeon, which is this giant egg-shaped world with floating islands. And then you can you know, hex crawl around these floating islands. So that does break up um, the uh, types of adventures that you're going to have and it adds some variety. For me personally, it's a little too vanilla. Um, just because going from room to room and fighting goblins is going to get old after a while. One thing that the book does mention is that there are certainly factions in here. So even on levels where it's mostly demi-humans, they have an antagonistic relationship between them. So a clever party would be able to use those politics to turn one faction against another. And that's really great. Uh, there is um, that focus there. And it's, the assumption is not that you're just going to fight everything. And a clever party wouldn't. Um, still, I like to see more things like weird items, weird tricks and traps, um, a stronger element of wonder, even on the lower levels, or sorry, I guess the upper levels, right? Levels one, two, and three, um, just to grip players and make them more excited about exploring. By and large, going into uh, the next room is not going to be a terribly exciting affair for the most part, with some exceptions. One little uh, tweak that we saw, or a nice little trick that he pulls off here, is that uh, some rooms actually have an eye, so they're actually labeled when they are illuminated, which is really nice. So there is really a, um, a level of attention paid to what DMs are going to need, giving them mostly functional information, things that players are going to ask about, things that players are going to try, um, and just making things easier for the DM, and I really appreciate that. Going on to the art, as I mentioned, all of the art is done by the same guy, and it is really charming. This isn't like professional grade illustration by any means, um, but this is someone who has clearly been playing D&D for a long time, has made this gigantic labor of love that no doubt they've run huge campaigns in, and is illustrating the monsters the way they envision them. It really harkens back to very early D&D when you see some of those manuals where they would just pull in random teenagers and have them just draw monsters and slap them in the book. It has that almost uh, middle school notebook feel that can be very charming and very homegrown in that sense. It's a very long book. I'm not going to go through the whole thing just because, you know, there's 930 rooms. But let's look at what we get in the back here once we get through um, all of the different uh, levels. So here's level 10. And then we get into new and variant monsters, each of which is laid out quite nicely although some of them do go on for quite a while. 
we have these concise uh, stat blocks that look very similar to what uh, the way that AD&D lays them out, which makes sense if this is intended for Osric. Going past the monsters, we have some new and variant magic items. And quite a few of them are things like they increase uh, stubbornness, uh, the chair of sleep, the elixir of insanity. So we have some nice weird stuff that you can throw in there to mix things up a bit. It definitely doesn't have the high weirdness that you would see in more modern OSR stuff. And that is just not the intent or the tone that this book is going for. We have some new spells for a new uh, class, the Priests of Afra. I think is how you might pronounce that. We have information about the uh, uh, long felt in the surrounds. So that's your main city. If you can have a little bit of a city campaign and you can flesh it out a bit in between expeditions into the dungeon. And that is the assumption that you're going to be exploring the dungeon as your main centerpiece of your campaign. We have a little dungeon in the uh, tower in the swamp that you can explore. So little side missions and we have the encounter packs. So these are the different types of uh, encounters, including some fleshed out uh, NPC parties, which is really cool. Again, reminds me of Barrow Maze, where you have these um, parties with their own personalities and inter-party politics that you can run into that you can either ally with or will come after you for trying to come in and steal all their gold, right? We have, uh, yeah, here's all of our NPC parties. Clerics, paladins, you can quickly whip up NPCs very easily. Encounters that you might have in long felt. There's a good amount of information for the city. You really could run a fairly um, intense city campaign using a lot of this information. Once we get into the actual uh, dungeon encounters, here we go, level 1A encounter table. It is really odd that it's found here in the back because when you're running the game, you're gonna be running it from the room descriptions. So having these encounter tables at the front of every um, level, I think would be more helpful, or perhaps even doing something where all of these were at the very front of the book and maybe all the maps were at the very back. That would make it uh, very straightforward to flip to them because you would always know exactly where they were, but having them kind of buried here in the middle is not optimal. When I was reading it, I had to search around because I wasn't even sure if there were random encounters, but like it's an Osric dungeon crawl. Of course there are random encounters. It just took me a while to actually find them. Then of course we get to our maps and then we get to the um, OGL at the very end. So that is Gunderholfen. It's gonna be a dungeon for a very particular kind of group. It's a group that wants to run AD&D in a very old school way, not necessarily an OSR way. So this feels like a lot of very old TSR modules in that it's fairly straightforward. The rooms are very clear. There isn't a lot of high weirdness going on. Um, how things work is laid out in a very straightforward manner. However, it does look like it is relatively easy to use. It doesn't overstay its welcome with long or over detailed descriptions. And um, if that's the sort of game that you're looking for, I think it would be very functional. You could easily flesh it out as well. You could pull out levels and use those just as a one level dungeon that you plop somewhere in your world. Or you can, um, as I mentioned, flesh out a level and add a lot more strangeness and weirdness to it using what um, is already here as a kind of backbone. The book is designed to be written in, so that would be very easy to do. Anyway, thank you for watching my review of Gunderholfen. Um, links will be down in the description below, as always, for where you can pick it up for yourself if you so prefer. And thank you for watching. I'll see you guys next time.